good. Uh, so this is the generative commons call for Wednesday, June 16th, 2021. Um, let's just dive in ourselves and, and uh, uh, take it wherever it goes and whoever shows up shows up and then I will do a better job of recruiting people to the call next week <laughs> and the week after. Uh, but I'm happy to see you here. Yep. Um, and I was just trying to refresh my brain with what we went through last uh, two weeks ago when we had the first generative comments yep. call because it was long enough ago that it's fading from memory. I took some notes and at the end of and copied things from the from the chat. And at the very end of my notes, we seem to have come up with the following. Shall I put it in Mattermost? Uh, that would be great, please. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm in the generative comments channel on Mattermost myself right now. Yeah, right. That's where I also found that's the perfect. Images. So we were sort of talking about a lot of different subjects and at the, towards the end, we were talking about how should we give this some form? And uh, the point that my notes ended on, and if I'm looking back over them, my memory ends on, is that in future conversations, we should look at these type of questions. Uh, what do we want to explore? What do we want to answer? What kind of output do we want? Is this a time-bounded project? And then there was the suggestion to set up a challenge for artists, cartoonists, songwriters, etc., who can make something out of what comes out of our, uh, uh, our uh, conversations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you paste that into the Mattermost chat? Yeah, I just did. In which channel? Because I, I'm in the Generative I'm, Commons channel. I'm on uh, OGM Gen Generative Commons channel. Oh, did I already post it? Yeah, I thought so. Ah, oh, there there. Now, now I see it. Perfect. Just, okay, good. Oh, so you... Just, I I think, the I think, yeah, you had pasted, but you hadn't hit enter yet. That's why yeah. I didn't see it. Yeah. Cool. Um, sounds great. And I think also, I think one of the things we ended on two weeks ago was inviting a broader range of interested parties to this conversation because yes. there are other people who give a big damn about this this you know this question and yep. have done and have done some work on it. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking in the notes. You mentioned that you know Lawrence Lessig. You asked the question, does anyone know David Bollier or Bollier? Bollier. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know his work, but I've never met him. Same here. Uh, let's see, did I get any other names here? Not necessarily. No, those those are the two names that, that I had made notes of. Yeah, but that, that's also a, an excellent thing to do, I think. Get, uh, get people who have knowledge of uh, generative commons and perhaps even vested interest in the generative commons. Um, exactly, and who've already invested in, in big bodies of work like the Creative Commons. Uh, yep. Yeah, so Silke Helfrich might be really interested. Um, and I think I think writing David Bollier and asking him, oh good, you just typed in exactly the same thing I did. Oh yeah, right, yeah. Uh, uh, that's good. Um, and I think, for example, asking, uh, asking David Bollier, who he thinks would be interested in this. That probably is a generative question. Yeah, um, yeah. And then I know that Mark um, has been working uh, a lot with uh, indigenous tribes. And uh, yeah. yeah, he might be really interested in, uh, in finding who from those communities would be interested in coming here because there's a, there's a piece about generative commons um, that, should be absorbing uh, wisdom from indigenous communities about okay. managing managing commons on the whole. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And going to some of the questions we posed at the end last time, uh, we can explore all kinds of generative experiences. And uh, the best 
work, although I have a feeling it's, it's, it's a little difficult to distinguish at the moment. The best work of Otto Scharmer, certainly at the beginning, before he became a, uh, uh, an extremely well-known person when he was right. doing his interviews before publishing the book. And I take it some of, some of the work that he's able to do, uh, either online or in person, is definitely generative. Uh, colleagues or former colleagues of his, like Adam Cahain, Cahain yeah. were working in that field. Uh, Bill Isaacs uh, working in that field. Right. Um, not so certain that they are want to do it now, but it depends, I guess, what type of output we want to want to get out of it. Yeah. Um, and there's so, uh, and David Bollier's uh, overall theme or umbrella topic, I think is commoning, living in the commons. Yeah. And I, and yeah. I think, and I think a piece of what we're talking about is the recorded part, the, mem the mem memorized, the, the shared part of the information part of living in the commons. I think yeah. I, I think commoning is a very nice uh, frame for this. Uh, although when you start to talk commoning, you very quickly go to the opposite side of the field, and this is only in my head, uh, from intellectual property laws and overprotection and all of that. And I think a I think a really important part of understanding the generative commons is under understanding the effect of current commons regulations on on creating and nurturing generative commons um, yeah i'll just put this in the chat here uh, and then huh there's an entire thread of ownership versus membership versus stewardship yeah uh, uh, Ecofeminism and uh, other alternative um, ownership regimes and other kinds of things, and how how might those coexist with current laws or or you know sprout from within current regimes? I, there's something really interesting there. Um, and and what I like is that Wikipedia and open source software and a few other very, very large projects that everybody seems to touch yeah. um, are really nice examples or proof points that there's something nice and different and fruitful about digital commons, Yeah, about the new commons. Um, yeah. uh, we should also invite Doc Searles in here and people from the Ostrom workshop. So, so I didn't realize it, but Doc Searles has a long history with the Ostrom workshop in Indiana. Uh, at, in Bloomington at the university. Yeah. Um, and I have a friend, uh, Charlotte Hess, who's kind of just retired out. And Charlotte yeah. uh, did a bunch of work. Uh, she, Charlotte co-authored some papers with Lynn uh, and things like that. But I'm, I'm thinking we could find uh, a few, uh, you know, some participants from that workshop and figure out what's up there, so. Yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent idea. So I, I co-wrote an article, uh, uh, time flies, huh? uh, several months ago about uh, uh, digital commons and things like that. Did I ever send that to you? Uh, what's its title? Uh, co-creating bar in, no, co-creating futures in a virtual bar. I do not think so. Okay. Let I would me, love to see it. Let's see if I can... Yeah. Get a copy in here. I, I did it with a, a, a friend of mine, and it was actually a, for a Springer book, which will be published shortly about hybrid learning spaces, but we more or less ignored hybrid and learning. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and uh, talk a lot about the the what you can or should be able to do in a digital commons. Uh -huh. And uh, let's see, can I get that easily here? And it does ask a lot of questions. We have, as both of us being at that time, certainly rather digital uh, literates, 
maybe simple questions that the people in open global minds could trash us with. But still, it does deal with some of our uh, thoughts about digital commons. How am I going to get? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have it posted online any place? Is there a, no? You, because it's it's a, it was the version we sent was for publication at Springer. So I in the future. Okay, okay. So, so it's not online but yet. But I do I do have a version if I get the right place for it. Uh, and in addition, uh, I'm writing at the moment another article with two French, three French colleagues uh, about. Uh, leveraging distributed collective intelligence in a digital commons. Uh, two of them are very much more professor-like and intellectual, but there's interesting stuff in that as well. And I'm giving a workshop on that theme at a Urban Living Lab Summit uh, next week online. That's, wow. Uh, this is a... Um, that's very cool. Um, and you're making me realize that Anne, Annie Peterson, what's her name? Um, why am I forgetting her name? Uh, uh, no, not Anne Helen Peterson, different person. Um, oh, heck, also a three names starts with Anne. Uh, Annie Murphy Paul, there we go. Oh, don't um, know. I've just made contact with Annie Murphy Paul, like friending her on LinkedIn or something like that. She's a science yep. writer uh, who's written a, a, a bunch of things. Oh, I know. So she just wrote, uh, this is what happened. She wrote a, an article called How to Think Outside Your Brain uh, yeah, for the New York Times, which I, I will post the name of it and the link to it in our chat. So she wrote this article, How to Think uh, think outside your brain, which yeah. is a lot about collective intelligence. Um, and I really like the article. So I yeah. posted about it on Twitter, connected to her and said, you know, thank you. And then I brained it and sent her a link to the, to the brain, uh, braining of it, <clears throat> because it's, yeah. it talks about the extended mind thesis and a bunch of other stuff. Oh, nice. Um, nice. And I think that, she would be a really she would might might be interested in this this conversation excellent excellent um and she might have ideas about who else okay so so i think one thing we could do productively is generate a short you know three paragraph invite to this conversation yeah and we are already turning a lot on who else to invite into the yeah. conversation uh, but I think if we came up with a couple paragraphs for for a letter, that would be really useful. Yeah, I agree, definitely. Um, cool. Uh, should I just start a Google Doc and share it with you? Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Let me do. Let me do that. That's the simplest path to a collaborative doc document right this second. I would go to OGM Wiki and start a doc, start a file and all that, but I'm uh, I'm unclear where to put it and all that, and I know I can move it later, but I'm just going to start a new Google Doc for Grins because that's really easy to co-edit with you. <clears throat> um, huh. So you, you probably followed that thread started by Gil Friend yes. about the uh, painful conversations. Yes. And um, well, I didn't reply to that. I was really glad that uh, Ken and some other people jumped right on it. But I mean, you can have painful conversations at a superficial level and can have painful conversations at a deep level, and you can have a really deep going conversations online, and there's all kinds of things like that. But what what do you want in a generative commons? You want to be uh, uh, proven right, or do you want to be shown other new ways of thinking, or do you want the chance to develop with uh, other people new ideas that you could never get yourself, or do you want to take some of ideas and speculate on 
practical or impractical ways to put them into practice. So I think that's a, that's a really interesting question also, also for our Google Docs. Uh, if we carry out the conversation, is it a conversation for conversation's uh, a sake, which is also fine with me because I'm very interested in sharing ideas about it, or do we actually want to take it someplace or inspire other people to take it someplace? Mm -hmm. And um, my feeling would be yes and yes. And I agree. And I just put a link to a, a, a Google Doc I just opened in the Mattermost chat, um, just so that anybody anybody in our conversation can go to it and add to it. So let's let's just uh, start a letter there. I think I think there's a couple things here. One is at least in the early going, we want to flesh this idea out as broadly as we can and be yeah. very, very inclusive of what generative commons means, means what commons are, who yeah. minds commons, uh, the bigger questions that this opens up, like we were yeah. saying a moment ago about, you know, membership versus ownership versus stewardship. Yeah. You know, th th I think, I think like upfront, let's, let's, let's open up those conversations and make, make room for all that. Yeah. And then thinking slightly longer term, we need to figure out who feels strongly enough about this or already has a venture going yeah. near like this that they could own this uh, longer term. Because I think that one of the questions you put up right at the start of this call was, does this have a deadline? What is our, what, what are we aiming for? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and for me, um, I don't know who in OGM wants to be long-term, you know, leader of this project. I, I know I have too many things going on. Yeah. And this is not my sweet spot. I just know that it's urgent. Um, yeah. So we need to find one or more people who would like to, you know, yeah. just do this because they care a lot about um, how this works. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think we have a, a twin project of rich conversation to get a, a good first cut, a good first draft, uh, build up the website. You know, we own the domain. Let's let's build something on it, and then recruit uh, a more permanent group that really wants to carry this forward. Yeah. So, and are you putting those in the chat? Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. <clears throat> um, perfect. Um, and I think that, that's, you know, a reasonable set of things to, to go after right now. Yeah. So, I so in the in the in the email, I'm, and I'm envisioning this conversation. You may want to join just as a, it's a simple email, personal invite yep. sent from us yep. um, who are in it. Um, and uh, I'll just start any place. Um, And uh, <clears throat> um,
small. There we go. Oop. <clears throat> Sorry. All right. No, I wanted to uh, put something there while you're still working, so I need to get down below you. Uh, yeah, just just go just go below me. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, paste. Oh God, yeah. And yeah. Take that out. Cool, and we also own the domain generativecommons.org. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, so th this, this got me into a little trouble on the first call because Pete was insistent right away that this be put into shared ownership because I bought it as me, as my own account. Yeah. And so we spent a bunch of time at the end of the call where Pete was like, this must be in shared, in shared hands. And I'm like, I don't know whose hands are gonna sign up for owning it together. Why don't we, you know, why don't we move this conversation forward a little bit? To get there, so I think that's where we end yeah. up. It's like, okay, okay, let's 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 back off on that. And I'm 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 extremely interested in finding people who want to sort of carry these projects forward. And then like, then we put the title to these things in some form of commons, right? We yeah. sort of we put them into Open Global Mind as a whole, etc. And and uh, I'm just getting to the point where Open Global Mind is a thing uh, yeah. that can actually hold assets and and you know represent things. So. Um, Cool. Yeah. So let's see what. Uh,
Let's see. Sounds good, and I'd like to remix what we've got, and then have a couple yeah. other people have a couple other people come in. Uh, you'll notice that I, in writing normal text, I often put commons in with a capital letter. Yeah, uh, and I yeah. do that. I do that on purpose to call it out. Uh, I, I'm one of those people that still writes internet with a capital I. Oh right, yeah, exactly. Because some people yeah. were like, "Oh, it's just internet. Let's like let's do lowercase." And for me, like the internet deserves mm -hmm. a capital I because it is. A set of agreements and a set of protocols and and all of that so so for me and this is just my quirk but i like it um i'd like to capitalize commons as often as i can so i i, I also just wrote common goods where i didn't capitalize it because i didn't mean the commons there right yeah no i um, i agree with you i'm very uh fond of calling things out either with a capital letter or an italics or or uh, single quote marks around it. So people know that either somebody else has called it that or I or we are calling it that. Yeah, I to totally like that, yeah. Perfect. So I think this is a, a, a reasonable start for, a, uh, for an invitation letter. Me too. And, and I think if we um, uh, publicize next week's call on this list and a couple other places, uh, ask people to come look at this and make it better. Yeah. Uh, I think we'll we'll have a nice email we can send out. Excellent. Yeah, I, I've got at least two more weeks before I go on uh, vacation. If vacation, we want to go to Germany if that's actually possible. Uh -huh. uh, so I've got at least two more calls I can be at. And while on vacation, probably I try, I. I mean, I'm, I call myself semi-retired. My wife is now retired for about a month. And I sort of promised her that we'd spend some time together during the normal weeks, like lunch together and uh, dinner together and the trip together. But when yeah. we go on a vacation that I try to do as little uh, internet as possible. So I may yeah. not be able to join any calls on uh, internet, but if things are, are continue to get posted on a doc like this or on Mattermost, I can always uh, refer to them because she tends to go to sleep an hour and a half earlier than I do. <laughs> <laughs> I stay up later than my wife as well. And I actually get up a little earlier than she does usually. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've got a rhythm. I'm originally was really a night person, and I've pushed my rhythm back from being at my best from four in the afternoon uh, to ten in the evening, and then carrying on till two two in the morning. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I've learned to wake up early and also be do intelligent things like especially writing and proofreading. But I do tend to, after I'm finished for the day at the computer, like to go down and I just put on television, sometimes mindless, sometimes documentaries. I've got a real paper book and a real set of pens with different colored inks. And I listen and I hear things and I uh, brainstorm with the television on them. Mm -hmm. So, and That's I can nice. carry that out till well after midnight. <laughs> That's funny. Um, I would think the person who has the most inconvenience from 7 a.m. Pacific time would be you. I couldn't think of holding an intelligent conversation that early, as I had to. 
and and i mo like most like monday through thursday every week i normally now have 7 a.m calls it's pretty interesting yeah. so so I, I get up at six and i'm i'm alert by this time so it seems to work okay i don't know so far so far so good and i and i like i like it being 9 a.m and me having like done something so that that yeah. makes me happy yeah yeah, I can say that about myself, but then I like to get up at eight and read in bed when I, my mind is fresh, full of, full, of, full, of wor full of words and have accomplished some interesting stuff before 9.30. Exactly. The thing, when so, so the trade-off, the trade-off for me is that um, what I probably should be doing instead is uh, eating the frog first thing in the day. Have you yeah. heard the Have you heard the phrase "eat the frog"? No, no, no. So eat but the frog. I can imagine what it means. <laughs> eat, eat the frog means pick the largest, most important thing you need to work on and and do that first. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and so, I need to I need to flip some things around so I can eat the frog early. So yeah. <laughs> um good so i so in the so in the letter i wanted to put a link to what we've got so far which yep. is great yeah um good and um we i would like to stand something up on generativecommons.org pretty soon uh there's two ways to go about that one is to go on massive wiki and do what we did for open global mind. I don't know if you've noticed, but openglobalmind.com, we switched it over. Uh, originally I built it on Google sites, which I love. I've become a big, big, big fan of Google sites because it's yeah. free, it's powerful. It makes yeah. simple, elegant websites. I can do it. It does collaborative editing. Other, I, I can I invite other people to edit. So like, it's, it's really pretty transparent. Um, but what we did was we moved it over to massive wikis <laughs> website builder yeah and so there's a directory on massive wiki that has all the pages and there right now it doesn't have many pages <clears throat> um for the new website so we could we could pretty easily stand one of those up for the generative commons but what that does is it restricts participation to people who understand how to post you know pages onto the massive wiki yes, exactly. and pete and pete is in the middle of trying to figure out what would it take to make that really easy yeah uh you know because right now you have to understand github and yeah you know a bunch of other stuff um, yeah. and that's a barrier it's a barrier to entry um yeah i i understand that completely i did a couple of tutorials with uh, ward cunningham about uh half a year three quarters of a year ago and oh, cool. uh, i learned the basis of doing it uh but it was such a uh, uh exclusive process that I sort of dropped it. Not that I didn't like it, because I found lots of interesting things on it, uh, but it does exclude a lot of people. So he was teaching how to use GitHub specifically or something else? No, his, uh, what did he call them? The FedWiki? Uh, yeah, Federated Wiki. Yeah, yeah. And I like FedWiki, and then I don't know how to use it. Like I look, and I look at people showing me stuff in FedWiki, and the opening up of one vertical window after another doesn't yeah. really, it doesn't make some, it doesn't compel me. It doesn't make sense to me. So, yeah. and then yeah. the little, the little thumbnail icons at the bottom re refer to versions of the document and, and so forth. And I don't really understand how to use them. Yeah. And then, and then anytime you touch a document, you basically fork it into your fed wiki and it becomes a different version of the same. And I'm like, wait, I don't understand yeah. that either. Yeah. So, but I, but it's highly decentralized in a way that's really good. It's yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I, I haven't figured out how to use FedWiki, and you know, David Balville is a big fan. There, there mm. are many, several OGM members who've done a, who've built a lot of things on Fed, FedWiki. Um, so if this remains mostly with OGM people, we could certainly use uh, uh, the system. Massive describing once it gets open to other people we might want to consider uh, uh using a more accessible uh, but I, I would imagine in the beginning it'll be mostly ogm people i think so and then even even with an ogm you have to be pretty geeky to to sort of work the yeah. 
you know, to install Obsidian and link it to GitHub and know, be oh, smart yeah. enough to be smart enough to push changes, you know, uh, correctly and, and to be sure that you've done the right thing. It takes a little learning and coordination. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of, the, well, you can also edit directly on GitHub. So you could just get a GitHub account and you could use the GitHub editor. That's doable. Yeah. It's doable, but kind of really ugly. Yeah. Uh, because the GitHub editor is kind of a line, a, a, a very simple line editor. And it's like, oh, oh yeah, not yeah. that exciting, yeah. but that's doable. Um, okay, so so we have to kind of pose. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we should leave that to uh, when we get a few more people in the group, what they think. Yeah uh what i didn't really emphasize in the last conversation uh when it all got caught up in uh in uh, sexism and uh and and such uh was that aside from it having been a conversation of older white males mm -hmm. without black people uh, orientals or women uh, there were no teenagers in it, and I do think that whatever generative commons is now, it's likely to be a lot different in the next 10 years, so those different age groups should be involved in it as well. Exactly, exactly. Um, which makes me think of what young people care about commons and the rules of commons and things like that. That's a great yeah. question as well. Yeah, I have uh -huh. no idea. Let me put that in the... I'm, I'm typing it in. Oh, okay, good. Yep. Cool. Um, I'm, I'm older than I look. <laughs> so I'm, I'm one year younger than Leif Edwinson, uh -huh. who is about the age that he looks. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, when I talk to people now, I tend to be... Uh, much more thinking much more in terms of yeah if i do work now i want it as a kind of legacy that other people can pick up after i'm no longer able or 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 so to do it yeah. and in order to have it as a nice legacy you need a nice spread of different generations uh, not only 60 and 70 but 50 40 30 and as far as i'm concerned all even down to to pre-teens Totally agree. Totally agree. Um, uh, some time ago, gosh, well, maybe almost a year ago, was it before lockdown? Um, we had an Inside Jerry's Brain call. I had a whole series of calls called Inside Jerry's Brain before I invented um, OGM. Um, and on one of the calls, the, 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 the topic of the call was Jerry's Brain after Jerry. Yeah. And it was like, and it, and it was inspired partly because April and I were, were updating our wills and things like that. And we don't oh, own okay. any, we don't own any Picassos and we don't have like a, <laughs> we don't have a complicated legacy, right? Um, the one asset I have that I actually need to think about for my will is what happens to my brain and the brain data. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and it would, it's easy enough to just make it available, you know, openly, but it's, but it's a proprietary format file in a tool that might go away. So, but, but. As a, as a snapshot of the day that I died, that's pretty easy to do. Um, the question then is, how might my brain be a seed for something else, be like a sourdough starter for something broader? And Pete Kaminsky made the really astute comment of, the only way that's going to happen is if at the time of your death, there is a community of people who know and are already doing that, right? And that's the only way that works, is if there's yep. more than one human, many humans, who yep. understand what that means and are building it out. And so it's not a huge motivator for OGM, but it's definitely in the picture of OGM as a community that could do exactly that. <clears throat> and so one of the things I need to create right now is a challenge uh, that comes out of the Free Jerry's Brain conversation. And the challenge is, hey, we've exported my data from the brain into a simple database. <clears throat> um, here's six different levels of challenge for what one might do with this data, yep. right? And one level of challenge is what would machine learning like to do with this data? Like how many different uses for machine learning are there with something like this? Another challenge is what does a conversation look like between two people who curate data like this? Yeah. And, and it, you know, user experience uh, designers go crazy. Like, like figure out 
what does it look like when, you know, what if I run into a QAnon person who is also obsessive about externalizing their belief systems, right? Yeah. I would like to have that conversation. Yeah. I would really like to have that conversation and I'd like to figure out what that looks like. Right, the way that Minority Report had, you know, Tom Cruise wearing gloves and goggles and doing right. the, the, the thing that everybody yeah. saw and was like, "Ooh, that's really cool." Yeah. Right. Um, so what does that and, and 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 that movie had a bunch of advisors that are in the communities of people we know. Like I think Kevin Kelly was an advisor to Minority Report, oh, yeah. uh, and and several other geeks that we know. And so and so that little simulation was informed by some pretty legit geeks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so trying to figure out how, how to do that. Um, it, are there other aspects of generative commons that light up for you that we haven't talked about here? I, I'd love to just, since it's us, I'd like to just hear what else, the, what else this means to you. Well, since I'm, I'm much more a practitioner, I mean, I, I love abstract thinking, but I especially like then to test it if it really works. What really interests me in the generative commons concept is how it can be put into practice in such a way that it doesn't immediately get commercialized, that it can uh, discount ownership and intellectual property when being used to address uh, major societal challenges like the, the UN's SDG goals. Uh, so what I would like to work towards in a process like we've been talking about is a type of prototyping, get, get after the rich conversations, get a couple of best guesses, and then see how this can be taken into practice in a way that um, helps the world get a new way of looking at engaging lots of people's minds without having to worry about this is my idea and I want money for it. So it, uh, it can be addressed against climate change, poverty, uh, salutogenesis, uh, whatever. Any area. And also, so it's usable um, in, in multiple contexts, at multiple age yeah. groups, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the, yeah. the idea is to create generative co uh, commons so that yeah. kids in school are building it as well. And, yeah. and, and people in businesses are building it as well. And scientists yeah. are building it as well. And, yeah. and you know, th there's some idea of provenance of the information. So you know that this came from a seven-year-old and this came from yeah. a, a PhD or whatever. That's, in, that's yeah. interesting and important. But the idea of sort of collaboratively building out this commons yeah. matter, matters yeah. a lot to me. Yeah, cool. And to do that, you do need a set of orchestrators or curators, and it could be done in a in a very citizen centric way, and uh, like like jury duty or any other kind of of of, of way to get uh, random, but in this case, probably interested people involved in curating and orchestrating it. Uh, but the idea that interests me at the moment is who owns it? Well, mm -hmm. you could say in, in a sort of idealistic uh, uh, fashion, well, it's a societal challenge and the United Nations owns it. But mm -hmm. wouldn't it be better if you could say that uh, the people of, uh, well, what can I say? The people of the Southern Hemisphere own it, or the, mm -hmm. the people who drink uh, uh, river fresh water from rivers own it, or what, whatever it is, some, some, something relevant to the issue you're dealing with. Yeah. And in that sense, you would need a, a kind of democratic principle for shared responsibility, uh, no individualistic ownership but someone's got to take charge because mm -hmm. shared ownership is often no ownership mm -hmm. yeah uh, but you, you it has to be crafted in such a way and I, i'm just asking questions out loud because mm -hmm. i'm dealing with them in 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 that article i've I, with the french people i've been writing um 
you, you want to get as much response, shared responsibility as possible, but everyone knows you can't have 6 million people voting on what goes forward. So somehow it has to have a very sharp edge of the, of the, what do you call it, the edge of the wedge? No. Uh, tip, of the, tip of the spear. Uh, tip of the spear. Sharp, sharp boundaries. Yeah, uh, there, there's another expression I can't come up with because I've okay, been okay. thinking in Dutch so long. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, the thin end, edge of the wedge, was it? Yeah, yeah but I mean, it, uh, somehow, it has to be, and that was my basic idea for the Global Lab for Societal Innovation, or this other concept I'm trying to co-develop, the Distributed Living Lab. It has to work on local level, dealing with specific local challenges, while at the same time, there's people looking over each other's shoulders to see what works in 10 different local situations. Ah, is that generic? Is it generic to 50 year olds wearing glasses? Is that generic to knowledge societies? Is that generic to whatever? Right. And that's, that's sort of the vision I have of a generative commons that somehow things can be found that work on local level, regional level, uh, planetary level, whatever. But who can say that? So somehow there needs to be governance built into it. Exactly. And, and one of my fears is that this gets watered down the way natural and organic have been watered down because, because when terms create strict adherence principles and those run counter to the large industry, you know, yeah. industrial groups, uh, the large industrial groups proceed yeah. to, you know, try to try to get in there and mess them up so that so that, yeah. you know, if you weaken the standard, then this your substandard produce still fits the, the category. Yeah, um, exactly. And, and so how do how do we define generative and commons in ways that protect the, those commons over the long over the long term? Yeah. I also wrote in the chat, like the World Intellectual Property Organization and the WTO are part of our problem here. And, and I'm wondering, and you know, the World Social Forum was an attempt to protest the World Economic Forum and to say, hey, there's an alternative arrangement for doing things here. But I don't know how many things have spilled out of the World Social Forum's efforts that we have adopted, that we take for granted. Um, and I think that the conversation we're having would be appealing to the World Social Forum perspective on things. But but how might, you know, is, is there a way to, over the, over the very long term, is there a way to influence WIPO and how, uh, how global treaties treat uh, commons and information that's much more humane and much more collaborative? Uh, and that would be a big, for me, that would be a huge win. Like, like yeah. it's a negative. It's like getting rid of crappy, crappy rules is a negative. It's not a positive yeah. thing. Yeah. But if yeah. the crappy rules are busy destroying things, yeah. Okay, good. You've 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 like gotten rid of a big barrier for collaboration and growth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. So what what is the what is the poison pill? What is the formula? You know, puffer fish are are very slow moving fish, but when they're eaten by another fish, they inflate themselves. Uh, you know, and uh, suddenly like you've got a, a mouthful of spiky stuff, so you spit them back out. Or you know, most toads have poisonous like warts on their surface, and they're not very fun to eat. So other animals learn not to eat toads too much. It's good. Like like, how do you create a how do you create a, a an agreement for the commons that is dur that is resistant to uh, being eaten? Yep. Cool. Absolutely. Um, so let's, so um, I need to do a better job uh, of uh, telling people that these calls are back on and that we're going to do them on, you know, at, at this time uh, every week for a while until we, yep. until we, until we achieve sort of the short-term goal, the short-term aim um, and stand it up as a, what we formerly would have called a quest uh, in yeah. OGM. <laughs> and I, yeah. I, I don't have, I got convinced that guilds and quests are not great terms and maybe a name for a quest is a project 
<laughs> I don't know. Project, but, project or initiative would yeah. probably be more neutral. Oh, good. Yeah. Hey, Judy. Yeah. Hi. Hey, didn't sorry see to be so in. late getting here. That's all I right. Thought I could get here sooner, and then there were inter intrusions. <laughs> Intruders. Um, great to see you. Thanks for joining. Uh, we were we were maybe just going to wrap up pretty soon, but uh, happy to happy to have you here. And uh, do you want us to catch you up? Yeah, if you've got a, a couple minute summary of what you talked about. You bet. So we started. So um, one thing that came out of the last uh, call, which was two weeks ago, the first the first call on this thread was uh, we need to invite other people who really care about this topic into this conversation, into the into the you know this series. And so we brainstormed for a while, who does that mean? And if you scroll up the Mattermost chat, the channel called Generative Commons, that's where we've been chatting the whole call. If you scroll up that, you'll see a bunch of names at the start of this, you know, this, this conversation. Uh, so we did that. Then we were like, okay, how do we invite those people? So we, I created a Google Doc and shared that out. You'll find that link also in the chat. And the Google Doc is the beginnings of an email invitation that some of us, whoever's inspired to, uh, will send out personally to some of these people, some of these uh, potential participants that says, here's what we're doing, here's the intention, here's where we're chatting, so you can go look at what we've got so far, would you like to join us? And also, uh, we need more people who are more diverse than us, would you invite other, would you forward this to other people you think are, are likely participants? Uh, and then we, then we came back to the general idea, and we were kind of talking about, all right, so what principles do we care about? Uh, how does this how does this roll out? What are the pragmatics of it, so that there's an agreement that somebody cares about? Uh, how do you get more attention and more usage of it? Uh, you know, how does it exist on the ground uh, and things like that? Uh, and then at the end, we were talking about how do we protect it so that it doesn't get diluted, like you know, natural, you know, natural foods used to mean something, and then. Once, uh, once something is antithetical to how big pharma or big uh, food uh, goes about its business, then what they'll do is instead of changing the way they, they do business, they'll change the spec. Um, so how do, we, how do we defend the spec against dilution so that generative commons uh, is no longer that generative? And one of the long, long-term wish list items was, wouldn't it be cool if we could change the rules of the game at WIPO and the WTO, <clears throat> right? Because uh, part of our problem is that large business has, has managed to, to write into code, into, into legal systems, extreme, extreme intellectual property protection, and then run it across the world, and, including they've gotten rid of uh, complaint mechanisms and lawsuit mechanisms. Like, like part of what WTO does that I don't like at all is that it, it removes uh, methods for defense from people whose, whose rights and intellectual property are being um, abused. <clears throat> so how to do that? Sounds like uh, um, a good call. Sorry, I missed it. Um, you recorded right. it, I trust, so I can go play it and and hear the rich discussion. Exactly. Perfect. Uh, what else, Hank? Uh, I guess uh, we're back to, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the questions which we posed right at the beginning, uh, uh, questions we want to explore. What do we want to explore? What do we want to get answers to? What kind of output do we want? Is this a time-bounded project? And who can uh, make something uh, very accessible out of it? Artists, cartoonists, songwriters, uh, yeah. uh, video artists, or, or whatever. And I could imagine that when we're inviting people, we might also look for people who have those types of uh, skills as well. Uh, I mean, I listen to lots of music, but I've never written a song. Uh, I write a lot of cartoons, but I can't draw a cartoon. But I recognize how powerful those media are in getting uh, complicated ideas maybe not even complex ideas into the, uh, or let's say on the agenda of lots of lots of people who should be more aware of them. So. I love that. that. Yeah. Um, and so you just, you just made me realize like the oatmeal is a, is a, a cartoonist who's extremely smart. The oatmeal's infographic cartoon about Nikola Tesla, oh. which I will post uh, right now yeah. um, is, is, 
brilliant. Like it's a really good history of what Tesla invented. Uh, nice. uh, it, it's very, very good. It's called Why Nikola Tesla Was the Greatest Geek Who Ever Lived. <laughs> um, and I will post it in our chat. Uh, actually, I think if I just post the link, it'll pick up the name of the page. So, and are, is the chat in Mattermost here, or is it with the Zoom? That is, uh, I am posting it right now in the Mattermost chat. Perfect. Yeah, I love that we're using Mattermost for the chats. It's just so superior. Yay, yeah, good. And I and I love having a persistent yeah. conversation for each of our conversations that are, you know, yeah. it, 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 I think it anchors us a, a, a good yeah, bit. I really like the way we're using Mattermost. Yep. Cool. And then Susie Cagle is um, an acquaintance. Uh, she's a really, really good sort of political and, and other kind of cartoonist. She might be really interested. Uh, there's also Nikki Case, uh, maybe. Nikki Case, uh, mm -hmm. I support Nikki on Patreon and Nikki does sort of simulations and other kinds of visual storytelling. Oh, yeah. really interesting. So, so Nikki did a, a simulation that got viewed a lot about the tragedy of the commons, I think. Something okay. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I'm not sure it was tragedy that comes. I think it was something else. Yeah. In in my experience, uh, I talked to the ideas I'm interested in with lots of well-educated people who are in different fields, and I often get looked at as what kind of what kind of stuff from, from beyond the solar system you're talking about. So I've discovered the power of visualizing them, but not necessarily my visualization, but visualization uh, in by, by people who know how to do it, who can take the essence or the irony or the, the paradox of some of these ideas and express it in such a way that you go away and you keep thinking about Oh, the text in that song, or that that uh, couple of frames in that comic book, or or right. image in it in the film I saw. Exactly. And it, it, I, I think that's wonderful. That's I think it's so powerful. It it's really the picture is a thousand words, but it's more than that because the picture engages the mind in a whole different way in terms of the wholeness and the. Um, potential vectors and all kinds of things. It's just, plus it reaches the audience that has a really crappy reading skill. And that's a lot of, a lot of people these days that are, yeah. you know, sort of stuck in not even sixth or seventh grade, but fourth or fifth grade reading levels. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. And that's, um, that's a challenge we should defer to another discussion, but I think in terms of engagement of humanity and the generative commons, it's pitched at a pretty high level of intellectualism at this point. Yeah. In terms of technology capacity and literary capacity and other things. And the engagement of larger numbers of people with lesser levels of education is something that we should consciously talk about. Um, okay. I love that. And I just added a paragraph to the, to the email invite letter that says, it isn't just policy wonks we're inviting. It's also comics, artists, poets, songwriters, and others who might help communicate the ideas of, of generative commons. <clears throat> well, when you think folks. about social movements, if you, if you don't have to go back very far, even in developed countries history, where it was totally oral or pictorial because there wasn't the literary knowledge base and framework that is constant now. And I have no idea what the literacy levels are around the world, but I know they've greatly declined in America Mm -hmm. And it's pretty appalling what the literacy levels are. A couple, a couple small notes, like song lines in Australia with their Aboriginal peoples. Uh, song lines are a combination of map of the territory, um, mythological saga, uh, rights and privileges, recitation and recording, kind of meaning, and I'm totally making this up, but, but <clears throat> from this bend to that bend, Bob and Jane over there have rights over whatever, right? And, and the, song, the way that Aborigines treat the landscape isn't like this plot only belongs to Bob and Jane. They don't do that. Uh, but, but the song lines, are, which are memorized and then sung and passed down, uh, hold m lots more information than just the mythology of how we got here. And you know that rock is actually the, a serpent that landed here and created whatever. That's in there too. 
um, but also they have several layers or versions of different song lines and they seldom want to tell the actual Aboriginal song line to anybody outside of the trial, outside of the group. Uh, so they'll have the performative version. It's like, you want to hear a song line? Here, we'll sing, we'll sing you one. But is that not actually the song line that we teach, that we're teaching our, you know, our kids? And so that's really interesting. Uh, and mm -hmm. then across the world, there are some sort of didactic songs. There's one I remember called La Vinchuca, uh, which is from Latin America. I don't remember Nicaragua, somewhere in there. And La Vinchuca is a bug that gives you sleeping sickness. <clears throat> so they needed to wake everybody up and say, hey, we need to get rid of this bug. So the song tells you that it lives in the fact where the roof meets the, the wall, uh, how to look for it, how to get rid of it. And it's a nice a salsa kind of, kind of <laughs> tune. Like, you know, it's actually a, a, nice, a nice song. So all of these things are things we can sort of reach out to. That would really change the dimensions of the commons too, which I think would be perfect. Yeah, absolutely. So, so that's so, my bit of so first comment today. <laughs> Sweet. See, good start to the day. Um, anything else? No, I should let you guys go. <laughs> that's okay. I'm really happy you joined. Um, if, you, if you've got a few minutes, uh, let, let me pose a question which is uh, uh, consuming my thinking and the thinking of a couple of very intelligent people uh, I, I know, including Leif Edmondson. And that's the difference between an idea with a small i an idea with a capital I and a meme. Um, and I just typed that into the chat just so we'd have oh, it okay, good. recorded. Yeah, yeah, I just did that. Um, yeah. and, and I'm happy to just riff on that for a second and Judy would love if you wanna jump in as well. Yeah. Um, so, so for me, one of the important thoughts in my brain is we're in a titanic battle over the scripts in our heads, yep. right? And so for me, the battle over ideas, I think with a capital I, that everybody agrees to. And if you read Yuval Harari, uh, he's yep. saying that one of the things that distinguishes humans is our ability to create collective fictions with, that guide our society. And I like that a lot. And to me, like religions are collective fictions, governance mechanisms are collective fictions, and also things like, you know, trickle down economics and the Laffer curve. And I just, I just recently watched on video, there was an interview of Arthur Laffer and one of the really wise, smart social critics, you know, young social critics. And they were like pounding on Laffer for having given us this, this thing that ate our brains back in the day that said, all you need to do is cut taxes for the rich and it trickles down because they save more, they spend more, and suddenly poor people have stuff. And it's like complete and total bullshit. But, mm -hmm. but somehow we bought it and made a lot of policy around it. So to me, that's a capital I idea, right? Yeah. Um, if, if you're lucky, you propagate your idea and it becomes a meme. Like Laffer Curve, I think, is a meme right? Trickle down economics is a meme. And in my brain, there's all a different thought about, um, uh, I might even use the word memes, I'm not sure, but, but sort of um, the, 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 the conservative side of American politics is really good at choosing phrases like the death tax. It's normally called the estate tax, but when you call it yeah, the yeah. death tax, it sounds terrible. Who wants a death tax, right? Death panels, when, when Clinton was trying to do, and Obama were trying to, to change insurance, they, they would pick terminology that made these things sound terrible. Uh, and then tax and spend liberals and all those things. Those are memes that were very intentionally propagated across conservative America and are used all the time and you can see them and smell them. The left is really not good at this. The left is just somehow ignorant of all this, even though the left has George Lakoff, who really cares about language and memes and all that. And, and Lakoff is a friend, by the way. So if you wanted to, oh, yeah. Yeah, wanted to yeah. he used to live near me in Berkeley and yeah. I've been to a couple of events with, with George. Um, so for me, a little idea is the juicy stuff that we're talking about um, that we would maybe like to turn into a capital I idea and a meme. Yeah. Right. So, so little ideas are like chicks, like idea yeah. chicks. And they're bouncing around going peep, 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 peep. And we're trying to dress them up, make them grow big and strong, and then make them into like the big idea that moves around. And, and to me, this conversation, this, this question is important because if we can change the big ideas and the memes that are, that are common into the kinds of things we're talking about here, commoning and minding the commons and being generative together, 
um, we can af then affect a huge social global change. So other than that, I got nothing. Uh, I, think that, that, oh, sorry. Pretty, I was just going to say that feels like a pretty good slope to me. Um, but I wonder if something as simple as a thought is underneath the idea, because I can get triggered by a word or an image or a, um, a, a catch of some kind, which then leads to a framing of a preliminary thought, but it hasn't been fully developed. You know, it, it has moved to the little eye idea, but it hasn't been fully developed and perhaps with the input of other people into the large eye idea. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And then, then I guess somewhere along the line, it would be nice to move the meme making out of the uh, unconscious into the conscious more consistently, mm -hmm. because I think that we're hooked by people who have the ad campaigners or the um, word strategists creating memes that are deliberately doing certain things that aren't actually consistent with the capital I idea. Yes, and, and there's, and there's and also so a that's, really big disjunct between the words and the actual actions or intentions of the idea, which yeah, which is a mess. So that's all I have. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, not at all. So no, no, no. I'm hoping no, you jump in. That. This is this is all all open for me at at the moment because I've got another thought which I just would like to introduce here. Please. And that is the difference between a meme and a paradigm. And a what? So paradigm? A, a meme and a paradigm. So you, you call trickle down economics a meme. I'm wondering, is it not a paradigm which is time based? And I'm experimenting in my thinking with something that's not yet really clear, but I'll use the example I'm thinking about. Uh, most Western cultures have a myth similar to Pandora's box. Uh, be careful what you wish for. Don't rub the lamp. You'll never get the genie back in. Uh, mm -hmm. And if non-Western cultures also have similar stories and myths, are they kind of messages from something somewhere intelligence, consciousness, that people have to know, not time bound like trickle down economics, but there are certain things you shouldn't do or touch. Um, so, so trickle down economics, I think is both a meme and a paradigm. Um, and, and it's funny, like, I don't really like conversations where you get down to like fine grain definitions or distinctions between yeah. mission mission, purpose, value, goals, strategy, tactics, like those get really, they get overly restrictive when you get, when you lock them down too mm -hmm. much, but they're, and they're, they're broadly useful. But once you start like getting semantically mm -hmm. finicky, it, it doesn't work. But for me, trickle down economics is both. Um, by meme, I mean a really lightweight, flimsy little phrase or image or, or catchy tune. The, re the reason companies have jingles for their products is that the jingle, if it's successful, is a meme. And if I go dun, 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 you know what company I'm talking about. That's Intel Inside, right? And it's called an audio signature. And I know a woman, uh, Aubrey, I forgot her last name, who's like a magician around audio signatures. Uh, she works with Kevin Clark and has been doing this for years and years and years. And, that, and she's trying to invent little audio memes, <clears throat> right? The paradigm is the larger set of, of ideas behind the meme. And, and a paradigm might contain and float multiple memes. And you know, if you cross your fingers, you hope that some of them catch on and propagate. The idea of a meme is propagation. A meme is like a, it's, a, it's an idea virus. It's a, you know, talk to Doug Rushkoff about uh, his, the first book that made him famous, which was a media virus, I think, uh, back in the day. Uh, and Doug is also a friend if you wanna contact him. But, um, but but it's all about just transmissiveness and and you know a, a virus that is very contagious is really effective a virus that kills its host too quickly is not that effective because it runs out of hosts <clears throat> um, and and that's interesting here actually at first I thought what who cares about that in this analogy but then I'm like oh wait trickle down economics right right so 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 the mortality rate from it is, is slow enough and long enough 
that it doesn't get rid of the poor people like right away. Go ahead, Judy. Well, that just caused a, a quick fire in my, my head about maybe I have been using for a long time the wrong approach to introduction of change of thought and I should be starting at little I idea so that people come along on the ride instead of trying to present a well-developed idea which is more complicated to understand and may or may not reflect their buy-in potential. And, and it's like turning upside down my pyramid of knowledge from a communication engagement pattern. I'm gonna to have to think about that a lot today okay. and in the coming days, because I think it's something we need to think about in terms of everything that we're doing in OGM. Because totally. we're, such, we're such a group of intellectuals, we're used to dealing with full-blown ideas and picking them apart yeah. and all that kind of stuff. That's not the rest of the world. <laughs> exactly. And, yeah. and my, my, my hope is that we boil these things down to simpler things like memes and, and catchy things. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like the reverse knowledge tree. You know, yeah. how do you how do you get to the nugget and then move from the nugget along the paths? Because that's really how you integrate information as a human. And yeah. so it, it's I, I'm going to this is going to keep me thinking for a week, Jerry. Oh, good. <laughs> um, so a couple other things from what you said, Hank. Um, there's a, a uh, we've talked about this in a couple of OGM calls, but there's a guy named Adrian Hahn, who's a game developer who wrote a really interesting piece about whether QAnon is an alternate reality game. <laughs> so is QAnon an ARG? And if you think about it, there's a mysterious character named Q. Nobody knows who Q is, although there's suspicions. <clears throat> Q keeps dropping, you know, crazy information about how, you know, this thing is going to happen and then, which everybody then follows just like an ARG. And it, it, you know, QAnon is sort of just an ARG with like really bad real world consequences. It's an ARG that's taken, you know, taken life yeah. uh, in, in the real world. And I'll, I'll put the link to that, uh, yeah. to that article in a sec. Um, but I want to come back to what you said earlier about Pandora's box. And there's kind of, it's kind of things that cultures need to teach their kids. And yeah. they take, they take, they, they have to show up because they're part of staying alive on earth and trying to make things together. Yeah. And they take different forms and formats. And sometimes there's contagion of them because the same myth carries. And then, you know, <clears throat> a lot of the Greek gods become Roman gods. They just get a different name, right? Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, the attributes are the same and you can sort of even reuse the same statue, yep. um, <clears throat> but they're repurposed because somebody needs to represent war and somebody else needs to represent the hunt and somebody else needs to represent love. Uh, because that's how we're thinking about things and we're trying to personify these things about being human. <clears throat> and then there's this other, there's this totally other thread about morphic resonance, which was a thing that uh, Rupert yeah. Sheldrake came up with. And he was like, yeah. there was a, there was like a month when, when the starlings over here learned to take, pull the caps off of uh, milk bottles in England in five different cities or two different cities at this, you know, on the same month. And they, we don't think they talked to each other. How did that happen? And I, I think morphic resonance has sort of been debunked, but sometimes there's like, there's something in the air. Hey, Bill, how you doing? Um, and, um, and I think that's really interesting as well. And in, in that, in that some, sometimes those get manifest. And until 20 years ago, when the inner, inner tubes start getting big, we don't have the ability to send something around the world at zero cost, zero marginal cost, uh, all nearly instantaneously, right? And, and we did all that without thinking through the implications. So a lie can get around the world 20, you know, 10 times before truth has a chance to get its pants on, uh, which, which was said in a day before even, I think the tel maybe the telegraph was there. I don't think much more than the telegraph was there when, when that yeah. was said. So, so now we have instantaneous communication and nobody figured out that if there's lots of people with, with really bad incentives uh, on top of the same medium, that they might actually be able to take advantage of this. Yeah. Uh, Bill, we've gone. Uh, we, we, I know. I'm sorry. I had a bunch of. I uh, had a little <laughs> bit of a sick dog issue yesterday. I was. I was running around delivering stuff to the vet, <laughs> picking up meds, and you know. Hope your dog's better. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. you know. He seems to be. Uh, he's got a little whatever. You know, he's a dog. <laughs> <laughs> ah, he's a dog. <laughs> it's not really, been... yeah well he's not really you know he's not really concerned with the, the commons business yeah of course not 
but he's probably more reliable than most humans. So that's important to preserve. <laughs> well, anyway, so I'm sorry I, I was, wasn't able to jump on earlier. That's it's all right. I only came on about 15 minutes ago. So I, I just on. want to make sure before when you leave, what is there any actions I can take to follow up that would be productive? So a couple things. Um, uh, if you we're in the Generative Commons channel on Mattermost, so you'll find notes from the whole conversation there. Early in the call, we created a Google Doc and put that link in there, uh, which is basically a draft invitation letter. Because what we realized on the first call two weeks ago that we need to broaden this conversation that there's a bunch of people probably interested in this. So let's invite in a bunch more people and see who shows up. Uh, so we were brainstorming in the chat. You'll see names of people from Lawrence Lessig. You know, it starts with Lawrence Lessig and then goes to a bunch of other people. And then later we included like we need cartoon cartoonists and uh, songwriters and creative people also because and that, that got us into a conversation about memes and ideas, which is where you jumped in at the end here. Hank had asked like there's a burning question in his head and Leif uh, Edmondson's head and and so forth about what's the difference between a small eye idea, a big eye idea, and a meme. So that's the last little riff we've been on here. And, and, and for me, I'm still, this, I, this notion of less is more is exploding in my head in terms of how to get to, to not even attempt to develop much of a plan before you present it to people to bring them in earlier in the plan process. Um, it went from little eye to big eye to, to next step and to meme and I'm not even at the meme stage, although maybe the meme circles back to the little eye, because mm -hmm. if you've got a meme that works for the little eye, then you can get a lot more people involved. Um, but this notion of not trying to develop the academic treatise first to present to people for criticism, instead present the little eye idea and engage them in the development of a pre-agreed upon process. Yep. And maybe it has its horrible roots in attributional principles, you know, where the academics and other forms of valuation of people and capability has to do with what they developed independently, hence a dissertation, which only you did, that is unique and proves you can do it yourself, which is the antithesis of what we're trying to talk about here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I, I agree. Judith, I think that's, for me, I think the academic thing is uh, important because there's a lot of really useful, well-researched information. Oh, absolutely. You know, but I think, I think academia as itself is at a, they're at the same turning point the rest of us are. And if they don't get their act together, people are just going to go find other ways to learn. I don't need whatever this this thing is over here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the thing I would hate to lose is the body of all knowledge and, and whatever the, to the extent it is actual truth and knowledge and so forth, which is part of what the, the more traditional approach assures occurs because of the nature of documentation. Oh yeah, no, it, I think I, I agree completely about the, you know, we still yeah. need that. We still need the yeah. Library of Alexandria. I, I, but I, I think if we're trying to engage the world in a movement to save the world, we don't have time to try to address the educational gaps of all the people. We need to start at common language and simple actions and mm -hmm. engaging them in co-developing the simple actions so they have ownership and skin in the game. If also, if you leave a ladder nearby or a, a path and a map, um, people will follow it. So the, the hole in the wall project basically proved in a really blunt way that just leaving resources at hand, people are really pretty smart and they'll figure it out. You know, and kids taught themselves English um, to figure stuff out that mattered. Oh yeah, there was some story for me. Number sorry, just left a computer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, they just left. They didn't really do much. It just you know, here's the um, Sugata, switch, and here's like you know, blah. Sugata Mitra basically punches yeah, a right. hole in a punches a hole in a wall, buries a monitor behind it so nobody can rip it off and and mm -hmm. take it. Uh, puts a, a trackpad or something like that next to it uh, so that you know people can learn how to. Uh, the kids can learn how to navigate it and then doesn't leave any instructions doesn't do anything uh and walks away and these kids start to figure out how to use it yeah there was a long time ago there was uh, somebody from uh, tasmania who was wrote a piece in the I, an ieee journal about um the real thing to do what we in the west should should do for people who want to learn about computers is you just teach them here's how these machines operate mm -hmm. 
They don't need, <laughs> don't give them any programs like Word. Just here's how these things operate. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm ambivalent on that one because uh, the but power he, tools take a long time to, to, to show up. <clears throat> well, I'm back on uh, Joanna Macy's Dharma and Development little Oh, interesting. Book, where she said, you just got to go ask the people, the people where they are and know what they need. And when you come in here, I got the answer to how you can like solve your, it's like, yeah, just keep walking. You know, <laughs> this is, I don't know I'm on this thing and there's just a little bit. What's the book you're referring to? Dharma and Development. Might oh, Dharma and Development. This is jo jo Joanna Mason. Mason right? Yeah, from a long time ago. I mean, it's, uh, huh. I, it's, I have some worn copy down in my library. I mean, I can get a, a reference for you if, if you can't find it, but. I'm pretty sure it's not in print anymore. Cool. I hope somebody puts it Dharma Development. Boom. Okay. If if it's not in print, the place I go for those things is ABE, all the American Book Exchange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yep. You can you can usually find almost anything there. It might not happen immediately, but it'll show up. Yeah, anyway, I don't want to get into my um reading more about I'm in a big reading phase about post-capitalism and uh, sweet. So, <laughs> so uh, it's available on, on Amazon for uh, okay. Mm -hmm. 30 bucks as a paperback seems to be the only format. Yeah. And I pop it in the Mattermost list. So yep. we'll $30 feels like a lot of money. That's a really that's like real, I, that's like real money. Yeah. Yeah. When I bought it, it was <laughs> you can probably find it at a garage sale for 99 cents. Uh, well, way. anyway, but she but she was writing about how you know actually you can aid people who, you know. It was more like getting out of the, you know, where the developed world and we know things. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah exactly. but what you don't know is what I need right here <laughs> in my community. So, cool. Anyway, that's a, so, so I think the con, I think you're right about trying to get an invitation into more, but you know, this is a huge, huge, it's bigger than a pumpkin. Is it bigger than it. my Zoom box? Yeah, this thing is, you know. <laughs> yeah. I'm outside the window. <laughs> oh, nice. You're thinking, <laughs> thinking outside the Zoom right here, over here, over here. Yeah. Um, cool. Anything so else I should look at, look at that letter and make comments? or Yes, just, uh, or look or at or that it. letter, make it better uh, any way you yeah. want, uh, either comments or direct editing. Anybody who, anybody who has the link can edit. Um, and the idea of the letter, and it's a little longer than it should be right now already, but the idea is to send this to uh, potential participants in the generative commons conversation and project. Yeah, so I think, great. Do you have any ideas about what, uh, if I were to invite somebody? Here's the next, this project's next steps are. Um, so join, because, join, the, know, join the Wednesday calls and get on the Mattermost chat is what I'd say. Okay. And then, and then, and then on these calls is where we'll figure out what else to do and, and so okay it, i would say we're still in the little eye going to eye stage on what the generative yeah. is i mean there are people all the way along the continuum to it to an image that's far complex well beyond where the cohesiveness is at this point yeah. right um because people sort of people with a lot of knowledge jumped immediately to how do we keep it from being poached and how do we deal with intellectual property issues and things like that um and I think those are important, but in terms of developing the whole commons to make it useful for the most people, we need to expand the bubble. Yeah, and I think for sure that I know that in some other communities, I mean, I'm just in the knowledge management for development, the KM for dev people, mm -hmm. they have touched on these issues and you know, I know there's people involved with the UN development goals and all this, you know, and international scientific data who are also uh, yep. wrestling with these issues about, especially the property issues about information. I'm, I'm super interested in what they've learned, what they've decided, what they wish they had, you know, what has that community figured out about uh, knowledge management for development? Because, because because from my sort of like critical historical perspective, it's like, why is the world's best knowledge locked away in vaults everywhere? So apparently people who are smart write books and books are where they put everything, the best thing they know and books are locked behind DRM because God forbid, 
you should actually liberate the ideas in a book. So we're going to make you buy the book and then make it hard, hard, hard to copy the materials out of the book and use it somewhere else, despite fair use laws that should make that really easy to do. Um, and then scientific papers are locked inside of scientific journals and journal data databases and locked behind paywalls there mostly. And people like Aaron Swartz, who try to liberate them, or the woman who runs, uh, I'm totally- Sci-Hub. Sci-Hub, exactly. <clears throat> they're demonized because what they're trying to do is make this damned science available well, broadly. They're, they're demonized by the people running, you know, Springer. They're not demonized by scientists in the field who, you know, well, if, and then, and, if, and my, we, it's, you know, if my open paywall little thing doesn't light up green, yeah. I go to Sci-Hub. Yeah. And that's and, because I'm not associated with the university. I don't have any proof. I'm just a citizen in the world here. So exactly. And then and then you get these sort of uh, in between spaces like archive, uh, arxiv.org, not the Internet Archive, but the physics yeah, yeah, no. the physics preprint server, right? And so suddenly now there's preprint servers, and everybody's sharing out their papers before they go to the scientific journals, which is like the scientific journals, like no, you can't do that. And well, the, there is a, there is a there is a robust conversation among across several generations of scientists in many fields about this exact issue. So I think that's part of the conversation we need to sweep in. We need to like figure out how it fits the generative commons agreement. Yeah, I think we <clears throat> might find things that, have, that people are already doing that so that do not have to be reinvented as yep. well, because- Where do we know, look for that or who do we talk to, Bill? Yeah, let me try and find. Uh, I would love, I would love, 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 love to know that. From both from the big science perspective, like like you know standard academic and uh, applied and whatever science, but also from the technology for development perspective, like for for applied for development. And and Hank, what you just typed in the chat is, I think, one of the operating principles of OGM. But I'm, I'm, I'm trying to surface that. It's like yep. let's not let's never reinvent the wheel. If some if somebody is doing something, let's stop doing it and join them and help them. Yep. Uh, and, you know, and and let's only build stuff where it's missing and neat and necessary. Yep. Well, I just I just want to share a little story. I gave a paper once, and I was uh, berated by somebody in the audience because I hadn't read some kind of blah 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 blah, and. Uh, after the talk was over, an older gentleman in the front, he said, don't even listen to those people. He said, if the wheel had not been reinvented, we wouldn't have it today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was good advice. <laughs> that was good because advice. Because no one, you know, just, it doesn't. So I think it's good not to reinvent the wheel, but that also, you know, it's a big world. There's a lot of people and a little bit of reinvention, you know. It's, it goes a long way. Yeah, that's how you get to know things. Exactly. And, and what we're talking about is to amplify the reinvention and refactoring of everything. Yeah, see, that's where it's like, uh, well, so if you want to boil the ocean, right, there's an engine, there's the uh, like, there's like, we're going to boil the ocean. And there's, there's, for me, there's a woo woo solution to that, you know, and then there's the engineering solution, which is a pot at a time. Right, right. So, um, so, so there's a neighboring question that I'm not sure we're addressing yet that is probably important to address, which is the reason there's so much overprotection of the commons is that people need to make a living, want to make a living. In fact, people want to fill large pots of uh, you know, uh, large pots with gold, and they have by creating these overweening IP regimes that we're trying to sort of mitigate against. But there's a big active question in the back of my head, which is how do people make a living while feeding the commons, right? And there's some, there's some pragmatic answers to that, which is the, the story I tell over and over again about IBM and open source code. And IBM was, was in a death spiral. When I was a tech analyst, when I joined as a tech analyst in, 80, in 92, um, IBM was like the 600 pound gorilla in the room. When IBM did something, we jumped, we sent out FedExes to our clients with our analysis of the new announcement, the whole thing. And then like five years later, IBM is on the ropes and about to die because Sun and Apollo are eating their lunch and they can't seem to make anything interoperate and then they adopt open source. And then suddenly two years later, they're making two or $3 billion in service revenues on top of open source software by customizing the same software that they know everybody else can use. And that's super interesting. Yeah. So 
what is the what is the analogous route for other kinds of creators so they can make a living while feeding the generative commons? And for me, that's another big important quest for OGM, right? And and so one of the reasons I'd love, and this feels so far away, but I'd love to stand up a story threaders guild or practice that is a business that where people hire story threaders to come to their events and, and weave narratives from the pieces that would be missed by other people and let other, enrich the conversation or other kinds of guildy practices. One of the reasons I wanna stand those up is that I think that human performance of human skills amplified by cyborgy technology are the way to go. You know, the, the way that Pete Kaminsky can research things and pipe them into a chat in near real time I call Maven, Mavenology. I, I tried to convince him 20 years ago to buy the domain Mavenology and to, to like train other people to do this, but, but he wants to do other sort of stuff. But, but that should be a skill that corporations want and, or, and, and nonprofits want to hire because they actually need a Pete in their meeting. Having a, they don't know it yet, but having a Pete in their meeting is gonna enrich the meeting. Yeah, well, these are already have, you know, the, there's, we already know a couple of people. So there's Vincent. Right. Right, so he's also pretty good at just uh, like you know Airtable. Yeah, well, you can give me two minutes and I'll fix one up for your meeting. Yeah, so, I mean, so that it's hap there are people. I mean, this is, I think what you're saying is it it is happening. We might not see it all, but so at this point, like we can name a few people who love doing these things, and we haven't figured out how many different practices or guild areas there are, which would be a super interesting conversation to have. Although in, when we did the guild call on Tuesday, a couple of Tuesdays ago, we got stuck on the word guild. So we didn't actually get it into the meat of the discussion. Um, but there's not a lot of people out there doing these things. And, and um, so 30 years ago, nobody knew what a graphic facilitator was and nobody was hiring one. And there weren't any people who had that on their business card, right? And then uh, it, the idea of drawing what people are saying uh, became popular and suddenly it was a thing. And these days, today, I need a graphic facilitator means I can Google it. There's a bunch of little companies that'll, that'll, that, that, that will let me hire one. <clears throat> it's fantastic and it could be better, but, it, but that exists as a thing. These other things we're talking about don't exist at that level at all yet. And I'm saying, how do we, and how do we convert them from a little I idea to a big I idea to a meme, to a practice and a business and a job title. Okay. Um, Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. The work that I'm doing right now for myself, which is generative, is the work about what's the next, what is gonna be the next, uh, what do I say? Socioeconomic way that we get things done. Because Love what that. you what you just said yes. is more of the same. Well, how do you mean? Like um, it's when people are how do I like, you know, get away from, you know, what can I do that I can charge for? I mean, the whole that the book I'm reading, Post Capitalism, which is like right. five years old now. Yeah. Basically the argument that Paul Mason is making, which I don't completely understand yet, because it's pretty complex, but is that Capitalism has run out of mutations that it can do to keep producing profits. And the Which end is, result and the yeah. end result is going to be something different. Mm -hmm. And there are people right now, you know, who are pushing for that, not just I mean some, not just the you know democratic socialists who have an idea, <clears throat> right. Mason says, yeah, there's a lot of good there. And you know, socialists, and socialists are also hung up on some things that they could learn. Mm -hmm. So there's something like the Paul Romer economics article about endogenous technological change, where he really threw the whole monkey wrench into what happens in information products, you know, is that ideas are non-rival. Paul Mason says, we could use a better word. We could just say shareable kind mm -hmm. of less technical, um, but that, that is where the, the, the juice is now in the 21st century. Not so much in material, like the, the typical capitalist um, materials, labor. Right. And he said, even capital, 
itself. Right. Like we like we we have we have exhausted all the financial shenanigans you can do with capital. Right. So there are no new ones. We have the ones we have, like all that stuff with derivatives and making money out of money and blah blah. He says, yeah, it's but he says there's not a future for that. The, I mean, I don't understand his argument, but he's pushing this thing like information, right? And information technology is changing these long economic waves that people have talked about for centuries. Right. He said, yeah, it's different now. So really different. And capitalism, he says capitalism has been able to mutate. Whereas the Marxist said, yeah, it's just going to crash and burn because the work is going to take over. You know, a capitalist said, no, we can go find a new market over here and some new consumers over here and a little bit of this and push this down. And hey, look, we got another business in another 50 years of like, that's great. I mean, you know, but there are world wars and stuff that also juice the system. Mm -hmm. but, Go ahead, Judy. But there is, the, oh, so there's just this piece here that I don't, but he's pushing it. There is something different that is going to force us to think differently about how we work and even how we end up rewarding each other for that. Modulo, as you say, we're still living in this neoliberal capitalist hellhole, in which case, you know, I still got to, you know, figure out my copay when I go to the doctor. Which is, no, worse than that. Worse than that. Um, I had some skin cancer five years ago or whatever, and there were three different procedures to remove it. I'm like, so what's the cost differential, which is a question I shouldn't have to ask, which was unanswerable. Like, uh, well, we don't know. You need to call the billing department and they might be able to give you an estimate. Like, seriously? I know. Seriously. Sorry, Judy. Right, go ahead. Well, I, I half lost whatever the glimmer of a thought was because the conversation kept going and I right. was divergent right. here. Um, but the, the thought I had when you were talking, Bill, about the old system being archaic, it all had to do fundamentally with ownership rather than collectivism. And so it seems to me that the, the nugget of this is... Um, we're now into the ideas are moving so fast that you can't stop it and own it because it's already spreading. So it's a contagion of idea. And the, if there's, I'm not sure where it's gonna go in terms of attribution of value to it, you know, but maybe it's some sort of really low paced use, use tax, you know, a penny a pinch or something um, because the, the, if you want it to move fast, you don't want to fence it in. You want to spread it out, which is what we've been talking about in all of these directions. Um, and I'm not, I've been doing a terrible job of framing this because I kind of, I thought I had a wise remark and then I kept listening and I got diluted in my brain. So. No, no, I think you're onto something right there for sure. Okay. A couple thoughts. Um, Judy, one thing that I do to cheat um, to solve the problem you just had is I use the chat as my placeholder, short-term memory, and I don't hit return. So, so in my chat, usually I've got a bunch of things that I'd like to say, just in case. And then sometimes somebody else says them or whatever. Sometimes I just hit return and they, I just put them in the chat because we've moved on and whatever. Uh, and okay. then, and pretty often I get to go back and go this, this, this. And the reason I can, I can rattle off five things is that I wrote them down in the chat as a cheat for myself. Well, um, yeah, I guess ahead. where I was, where my, my head was taking it. And again, it was this I, I mean kind of regression yeah. um, was that, that I think humanity needs to go from I to shared I to capital I really fast right now. And I think that's so intrinsic in our intuitive, unaware sense of what's going on around us, that it's, it's kind of like a snowball rolling downhill. I don't think we're gonna stop it. What we wanna do is facilitate it. And we wanna learn how to be better at doing it ourselves so that whenever we're in whatever group we're in, you know, could be the line at the supermarket or something and you overhear a conversation, you pop in a complimentary with an E and an I Mm -hmm. aspect to the conversation because it reinforces the notion that's under development in the head of whoever is making the comment mm -hmm. and that's the kind of um, fiery expansion model that I think we need to galvanize the action that's necessary and then the, the folks who have the capacity to take action if they like the the little eye or the eye 
they'll modify the little eye to the eye they want and then they'll do something i mean it's like it's like vincent you know, you can mm -hmm. hardly say three words before he's already got it done someplace. And there's a lot of other people like Vincent um, who do the same thing. So I think this is, this is an exciting dimension that we're talking about here in terms of, for me, bringing hope. That, you know, because it's intrinsically enabling of every individual who contributes to the little eye becoming the eye. <clears throat> and that's what's been absent in so much of what we've done. Mm -hmm. I've got a whatever in my throat. Yeah, frogging, frogging your throat. <clears throat> but it's just the process has been more excluding than including mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. history. And so if we can get it, it's, it's not socialism in the sense of power of the socialism. It's socialism in the sense of this is it's communityism. You know, uh, it's, it's shared, I, it's shared actually, responsibility. So David Bollier calls it communism. And uh, Amitai Etzioni talks about communitarianism as well. He's been on communitarianism forever. Um, uh, three short things. Uh, I put a link that says, what are our two new stacks? And Bill, the, the question in my brain and in my head that frames the, the, the quest you're, you're on is, I'm borrowing software stacks, basically, like the LAMP stack. And I'm saying that we're, we're in a transition, we're in a punctuated equilibrium era where Occupy, Arab Spring, all these different protests and movements are basically saying the social contract is screwed. They're like, we need something better. And the, to me, the two new stacks are the societal stack and the organizational stack. And they may, they may overlap. I don't really know how this ends up. But when I say stack, it's like, what are the agreements and methods for the next 100 years from now? When we look back, we'll be like, oh, you know, the, the 2020s and 30s is when we switched to the new stack. And, and I don't know what the components of the new stack are. And some of them may well be post-capitalist. And I take, I take very much what you said earlier about what I'm describing as a way of surviving during, within the old model. Absolutely. Um, second point is, I don't see any countries at this moment experimenting with post-capitalism. I don't see that as a successful experiment anywhere on earth yet, right? We have China is, is, has moved toward capitalism with the Chinese flavor which by the way, they're, they're starting to call the sharing economy. April, there's this trope between uh, April and me where she has a, a Google query for sharing economy. And now every day, like China declares that, that uh, uh, chicken pellets are in the sharing economy and uh, you know, plastic powders are in the sharing economy. And April laughs and I'm, I'm frustrated because, because, and this is a little digression, but because for me, China figured out that sharing economy was a better meme to explain capitalism with a Chinese flavor than any other language they'd found. And sorry, sharing economy people who were actually sharing things were so sorry, but this actually, I think this feels better for Chinese, the China, uh, Chinese government to explain where they're headed with a blend of capitalism and communism or something like that. Anyway, that, that's my own take on this. And then last note, Hank, you mentioned in the chat that, that the old system was about ownership. I have a very different narrative about that. Uh, um, <clears throat> and my brief riff is, uh, many people's view of history is that we were tribal and poor and hungry and li didn't live very long. And then we got religion and then we got countries and then we got corporations and here comes the singularity. And that the arc of human progress and civilization is this upward curving thing. And I totally reject that. My, my, my notion of history is that long ago around the world, uh, those of us who survived because we were really good at killing ourselves off by exhausting our resources, but those of us who survived understood how to live in community on the commons. And if you go back into indigenous ways of knowing around the world, you will discover terms like munai and aiyu and uh, kaipiaki tanga from the, from the Maori. I, I collect them in my brain. Words about reciprocity and relationship and stewardship and ownership, which were taught, and that is how they stayed alive. And so my belief is that around the world, we knew how to live in community on the commons. And when I say on the commons, what I mean is they were managing the landscape, not individual plots of separately owned land. So if you read Dark Emu or Sand Talk or a couple other books about Australia, you'll, <coughs> you'll discover that if you read the journals, uh, there's one called The Biggest Estate on Earth. Uh, if you read the journals of the first fleet, the first Europeans who settle in Australia, and you read their journals and they say, it's so interesting. You, you know, we ride our horses inland and it's like it's a forest garden. You reach up, there's an apple. You reach down, there's a gourd. You can walk your horses through the clearings. What a beautiful place that nature created. 
And they look at these lazy, horrible indigenous people who are sitting there, you know, the indigenous way of, the Aboriginal way of fishing, one of the ways was, you set up a weir in the river, you put a bunch of big stones in the river, and all year round the big stones are in the river. Just before you know the fish are going to run, you go put the big stones at the bottom of the weir that block the weir and turn it into a trap. You then sit and party by the side of the river. When the weir is full, you go throw the fish on the shore, dry them, salt them, do whatever you're going to do. And now you have abundant, abundant fish for a while. And there's a bunch of other ways of trapping fish and catching fish that look lazy, but they're incredibly intelligent because you have 60,000 years of, of figuring this thing out and you pass it down through oral traditions, right? And the Europeans didn't recognize any of this as valuable. And then they brought sheep which basically ate the landscape that had been managed and destroyed the whole thing, like wholesale. And then they were busy trying to like westernize all the, they did the same thing that the you know, American and Canadian uh, educational systems did, which was try to, try to stamp out all of this wisdom. So my belief is that around the world, we had understood how to manage the landscape, that Europe in particular went and destroyed it worldwide. Uh, you know, the, the Treaty of Tordesillas, the Pope basically says to the Spanish and the Portuguese, when you go exploring around the world, if the people you meet don't know the name of Jesus Christ, they are heathens and you are allowed to take them and their lands. They are yours. And they showed up with guns and germs and steel uh, that the other people didn't have and they won. Like, like Cortez's takeover of the Aztec and, and Maya empire is astonishing. 300 Spaniards, like it's astonishing, but it happened, right? And, and, and so now we're trying to hit undo on a lot of this stuff and you can't really hit undo. So decolonization is the attempt to, to like figure out how do we rebalance? What do we do? Where do we go? And we're having a really hard time of that. And in the middle of this, there's some smart people like Mason who are saying, hey, here's how capitalism was really, really, really fucked up. How do we get to a new model? How do we hit undo on that? And, and again, Bill, I don't know who's actually having any successful experiments. Like the closest I see is basic income experiments in different places. And, the, and also some countries like Bolivia and Ecuador that are giving rights to nature, but that hasn't turned into really productive stuff yet. I would love to see post-capitalism actually run as experiments. And so then you move over into cryptocurrencies, which don't feel to me like a solution. So a lot of people are like blockchain and Bitcoin will fix this. Um, but then in the middle of all that are these little fledgling experiments with shared value and how do we recognize value creation? And those are really cool, but they're not getting much attention. Sorry for the long riff, but, but, but okay, for so me- this is, this is why we need more slower, longer conversations. Yes. And seriously, because that is like, you know, a dense pack from uh, you know Mikulski, which is super rich, you know, and, these, and there's and a lot to be, I and there's repeat. a lot to, you know, though, yeah. yeah. But I think they really need to be, you know, extended or expanded or, you know, made, you know, used again in a different way because the whole, for me, the whole issue with China is like, you know, well, China's going to fix things, right? Because they got a bunch of engineers. They're also a completely authoritarian government. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yep. Well, and, yep. and their culture is just totally different. Yep. Totally different. Well, this, this here in the why, United... Go ahead, Judy. Well, I was just going to throw in the word dendritic because that's what we're talking about. Got to talk about dendrites because that's how <laughs> we work. You know, so yeah. just uh, that link you just did to you know, Annie Murphy Paul's latest book, that real, that nice essay in the Times. Yeah. So that's a gold mine. Total gold mine. Yeah. Also, she's saying things that a lot of people just... Um, I mean, the thing she said in the beginning there about this, just this kind of overwork. I'm just going to beat learning. I'm just going to sit up all night until I understand it. You know, there's like kind of macho studying. Yeah. Which I did plenty of, and it's like, it doesn't really work. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't really, I mean, you get something. But at some point, well, you really got to take a walk because yeah. your mind is like, you know, it's like frozen. Well, well, not only that, but I think it would be a whole lot better if there were four of you confused at the same time because you talk about it and you find clarity. And yeah, so yeah. that's the that's the problem with traditional education yeah. and, and why I'm trying to move everybody to talking about continuous learning because learning is an interactive process. <laughs> and yeah, and 
yeah, and part of like coming into something new, like I've gotten a little bit more into economics and development economics, you know, and so I've read some stuff, but I'm like, I'm like, I'm again, I said to myself, you know, I really need to sit down and really just go through the whole online course, you know, from Samuelson. And I'm like, no, Bill, you don't have to do that. <laughs> you really do not have to study economics for five years before you can make a contribution here. Just you know, so I have someone else run, coming guys. in. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, okay. okay. Thanks, Hank. Keep keep going. I'll read more about it on the uh, the Mattermost, but I've got another call in about four minutes. The same here. Terrific. I've got someone else. And hopefully see this. you next week. Thank yeah, you, well, Hank. This is great. It would be nice to find a way to really because I think we need to we need more. Yeah. And yeah. broader and oh free God. association. I'm into that yeah. kind of like discussion. So Absolutely. I just typed my cheating into the chat because you just said weave. So uh, two things I wanted to say, like you just said, then we're frozen. And I thought, what's the name of the hit song in Frozen? Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> so there is that, right? And then the other question is for you personally and for everybody in OGM, like where are you weaving what you're learning? Uh, so, so like many people do blog posts and blog posts is an interesting unit of measure, but blogs are very weak for weaving context. They're, they're, and people, some people do very linky text, which I love. Like, uh, you know, when, when, a, when, a, when, a, when a reporter knows enough in an, in an article to put a bunch of very useful links in the middle of their piece, I'm like, this reporter knows where the world is heading, awesome. But for me, the flow of stuff that disappear, like blog posts, like, like they're just, they're dated and they drift down, down the blog, aren't enough. So, so I would, I would love to mind meld my brain with your brain with, you know, uh, Annie Murphy Paul's brain with other people's brains. But I'm the only one I know who's curating like how this stuff connects up together in this weird tool that's slightly wonky to use called the brain that lets me do that. So how do we, how do we move forward on that so that all the thinking you're doing and studying you're doing is easily shared into this collective thinking medium. Well, I'm going from massive wiki myself. Um, okay. Trying to use uh, you know Obsidian to create linked objects, uh, which are have some a... little excerpts. Yeah. You know the problem with the massive wiki is the front end is still a little a little uh, a little geeky. Uh, no, just a little. Uh, um, and it's not good enough. Yeah. Yeah. Just <laughs> inadequate. No, yeah, that's the word. It's an word for what to, you know, it would be better if you looked at, if you took Obsidian and did the, you know, the knowledge graph on my Obsidian notes, you'd get more information than the than the wiki. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know so, what to do about that right now, Jerry. I've been struggling so, with that for a long time. Perfect. So a couple things. Um, Pete just had a fire lit under his butt by Jordan recently. Um, I don't think I'm oversharing here, but Jordan basically said, hey, like, what's your plan for Massive? And, and, and Jordan sort of said to Pete, like, that sounds like a five-year plan. What, what would it take to do this in six months? Like, uh, off the top of your head, how many people would you need as devs to do I guess, this? Yeah, Pete told me this. He, had to be an hourly. he said, yeah, and Jordan is like, you know, how many people do you need to hire? Excellent. So, whatever, you know, whatever. Rafael, get that. Um, um, we're just about wrapping up our conversation, but you're welcome to join us. I'm early. I'll come back in a few minutes. Uh, okay, uh, you're well, totally welcome to hang out and join this conversation. <laughs> and we may or may not still be going in a few minutes because I gotta yeah. go. Okay, good. Um, yes, I understand. I think the massive. It would be. I would like to see some money okay. lit under this thing and produce. Because what we really just need is a front end that allows people to get into it. But experimenting with that front end is something I would like to sort of help host curate because I, I i'm not sure pete's vision for what to do with it is the thing that i want to end up using oh good yeah so so and the way pete is architecting it's open so somebody else can write a front end and like you know awesome i'm very interested in what that front end does and how it works like what you know what it lets us do what it's optimized for what it's good at what it's not good at all that kind of thing <clears throat> and i think that's an important conversation for us to have so that one of my goals is could millions of people seem to understand how to use Instagram, Pinterest, Snapchat, what have you, Twitter, and they're posting like crazy. Like there's a huge volume of those, of those little individual small units of, of, of content. 
and they're, they're using hashtags in a very sophisticated way and hashtags equals metadata. Mm -hmm. That's great. How do I add a tiny amount of complexity to that simple act that's very popular to then get the richness that I get from the brain? Because coming in and starting to use the brain is overwhelming for most people. I tried that. Instagram, I look at it. I, I guess Instagram I, is not overwhelming for most people. They're like, got it, done it. If I were to add two things to Instagram, I might be able to represent the brain stuff. And, and so Michael Grossman, who started Factor, has a very Instagram-y kind of platform and is really willing to experiment. I'm like, why don't we suck my brain data into Factor and then add a couple features to Factor that do that? And let's see where that goes. Well, how's he got me? So the job I would, so that sounds great. And I, but I would, you know, if we were going to do that, I would take some, I would lop off a piece of your brain. I'm like an engineer. Yes. When I look at this, I'm an engineer. Start yeah. small, keep it simple, be successful. And it's the top of the hour. So yeah. we should probably yeah. hold our call. But this has been like, hey, thank you both for showing up when you showed up. It was magical and important. <laughs> well, you're welcome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Again, sorry I was late, but crazy day. <laughs> I, 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 Lately, it, they're it, all crazy. <laughs> Yeah. Judy, I'm not sure you were late. I think you were just in time for what the universe intended somehow. Oh, here we here we go. Uh oh. Yeah. And, and did okay. I mention the power? Did I mention the law of attraction yet? <laughs> yeah. Don't get too don't don't pull that gravity stuff on us. All right. <laughs> All right, buddy. Sounds good. Take care, Stay everybody. Up. Adios, Thanks, guys. Bye.